All right, church, it is Sunday morning, so it is time to spend some time talking about Jesus. We are in this moment where we're going through the life of Christ. We spend about six months out of every year just walking through the life of Christ. This year we are uh, typically in the Gospel of Mark. But in the preaching plan, as it has been laid out and has been practiced by Christians um, across centuries and and uh, across places, uh, the text for this morning is one that we've actually already covered. I got ahead of myself. We uh, have already talked about it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use one of the alternative texts that um, iterates on, that reflects on the theme that we are in right now. In the telling of Jesus' story, we're at this part of the story where he is heading toward Jerusalem. Tensions are building, conflict is building between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. It's all going to come to a head as he comes into Jerusalem. And so we've taken up this theme of uh, the darkness and the death and the brokenness of the world. And we want to wrestle with all sorts of themes around those sorts of things. Themes that will eventually find their climax in uh, Good Friday, the day that Jesus is crucified. And um, then they will find their resolution in Easter and the ascension as we head towards Pentecost. And so what I want to do today is I want to use one of the alternative texts, like I said, which is um, reflecting on those broader themes. And the text is actually from Psalm 22. Now, if you are uh, a participant in my Wednesday night videos that I upload, if you watch those or comment on those or um, uh, walk through that with me, I talked some sometime back about Psalm 22, uh, but I want to spend a little time on it today for the rest of us for this time in the story of Jesus that we are telling and uh, think about what it says to us about who God is. And so let's start just by reading Psalm 22. Parts of it you are going to be familiar with. Parts of it, we, if you've grown up in church anyway, you're going to have heard before. Um, some of it may be new to you, but let's just go through it. This is Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from helping me, far from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I call by day, and you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted you. They trusted you, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. They trusted you and were not ashamed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by humankind and despised by people, all who see me mock me. They will open wide their lips. They shake the head saying, he trusts Yahweh. Let him rescue him. Let him del deliver him because he delights in him. Yet you took me from the belly. You made me trust while on my mother's breast. On you I was cast from the womb for my mother's belly or from my mother's belly. You have been my God. Do not be far from me because trouble is near, because there is no helper. Many bulls have encircled me. Mighty bulls of Bashan have surrounded me. They open their mouth against me like a lion tearing and roaring and poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dry like a potsherd. My tongue is sticking to my jaws and you have placed in me the dust of death because dogs have surrounded me a gang of evil doers has encircled me like the lion they are at my hands and my feet i can count all my bones they gaze they look at me they divided my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots but you o yahweh do not remain distant O oh, my help hasten to help me rescue my life from the sword my only life from the power of the dogs. Save me from the mouth of the lion and from the horns of the wild oxen. Answer me. I will tell your name to my brothers. Inside the assembly, I will praise you. You who revere Yahweh, praise him. Glorify him, all you seeds of Jacob, and be in awe of him, all you seeds of Israel, because he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hid his face from him. But he listened to him when he cried for help. From you is my praise in the great assembly. I will pay my vows before those who revere him. The afflicted will eat and will be satisfied. 
Those who seek him will praise Yahweh. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to Yahweh. All the families of the nations will worship before you because the kingship belongs to Yahweh and he rules over the nations. All the healthy ones of the earth will eat and worship before him. All of those descending into the dust will kneel. Even he who cannot keep his soul alive, descendants will serve him. Regarding the Lord, it will be told to the next generation. They will come and tell of his saving deeds to a people yet to be born that he has done it. Let me switch this back over to the timer real quick so we don't run out of time. <clears throat> psalm 22, um, and the thing I like about the Psalms in the general is that Psalm 22 speaks to circumstances of life for which we are familiar. Uh, Psalms, one of those bodies of literature in the Bible that as I grow older, they mean more to me when I was young and I had had many troubles and not a lot had happened and I didn't know much about heartache and I didn't know much about the tr troubles or, or the struggles of life. It was one of those things where like, well, this is nice and it's kind of pretty, but then it kind of just bounces off of you. And it, it might have with some study and some uh, looking at Hebrew words and some knowledge of how poetry worked in the Hebrew language, it, it might have been that sort of thing that it, it kind of appeals to you intellectually, but it rarely went much deeper than that. But as I've grown older and as I've experienced some things and as I've had some heartaches and, and some trials and there have been struggles in life and there have been things that were supposed to work this way, but then they didn't work that way and something very different came about and not always a good thing, uh, the Psalms have begun to mean a lot more. And I think one of the reasons why is because the Psalms ask these honest questions that do not flinch from being authentic and real in the darkness of the world in the face of God. One of the things I love about the Psalms is that the Psalms give us permission to have doubts and to be sad, to be angry, to be scared in the face of God. The Psalms give us permission to ask God questions like, why have you forsaken me? The Psalms tell us that God not only hears those cries, but God is big enough and compassionate enough and gracious enough to understand the circumstances from which those questions are born. And it begins with precisely that question, a question where if you live long enough in your walk with Christ, you're probably going to come to that moment where you ask that sort of question. I don't know, perhaps it is a moment of, um, of ill health in your life. Perhaps it is a moment where a relationship has fallen apart. Perhaps it is a moment where a career has fallen apart. Perhaps it's a moment where some tragedy has befallen you. Perhaps it is a moment where some unspeakable evil has happened to you. Whatever the case may be, too many of us in a world that is broken by sin, in a world that is controlled by death, we come to that moment where we stand in the darkness, we look up to the heavens, and we ask, God, where are you? And with the psalmist, we say, we've heard all of these stories. We've seen all of these accounts of you showing up and you delivering in the past of you saving your people, of you doing these mighty deeds. And from my very birth, I have trusted you. You've been my God since the first day. I've always belonged to you. I think about how in my life that I... As the story goes, I came home from the hospital and the very next place I went was, was to worship. There's not been a time in my life where um, God and worship and church has not been a part of my life. At first, because I had no choice and it, mom and dad said, you're going whether you like it or not. But that formed in me a passion and a, a desire to follow God. I have followed you all of my life and now I stand here in the darkness and I seem alone. I seem deserted. I seem forsaken. You've showed up in the past for others. Are you going to abandon me? Are you going to be far away from me? And the psalm does two things that are just really powerful there. And I want to reiterate this again and again. First, it acknowledges the reality of moments like that in our lives. There are going to be moments where we are so... Uh, inundated, so overwhelmed 
by the brokenness of the world, that those are the sorts of questions that will arise. It's not going to seem fair. We are going to seem like we are alone. We are going to seem like there is no hope. There is no way forward. There is no way out of this mess that we have found ourselves in. It is going to seem like God is very distant. There is going to seemingly be nothing around us but darkness. And Psalm 22 does not shy away from that. Psalm 22 says, yes, that is sometimes the way life is. Sometimes it does seem as if we are alone. Sometimes it does seem as if all of our time spent with God has been for nothing. Sometimes those who oppose us and who surround us and mock us will be able to say it seems with legitimacy. Oh, he puts his faith in God. Let God save him. Where is his God now? Psalm 22 says there's going to be moments like that for a lot of us, if not all of us. But what Psalm 22 also does is it says that God understands when we are in that position, that God is big enough to hear our cry in that position and not be offended. It's not sacrilegious. It's it's not being unfaithful. As a matter of fact, I think one of the things that the Psalms teach us is in these moments of darkness that crying out and complaint and lament against God, where are you at? Why have you deserted me? Wrestling with God in those moments is actually a means of faithfulness to God. God, even though you don't seem to be here, I insist on this relationship that we have. I insist on the faithfulness of your character that you have shown in the past. I insist on what I know about you. And so out of that faithfulness, I ask this question, where are you at? And so the first half of Psalm 22, it speaks deeply to the themes that we are talking about in this part of this season. As we head towards Good Friday, as we head towards Calvary, as we head towards the tomb, as we head towards the cross, Jesus understood well because it was Psalm 22 that he quotes on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if Jesus can wrestle with questions like that, so can we. If Jesus can acknowledge the brokenness of the world in that manner, so can we. If Jesus can... um, Jesus can come up against the darkness of the world, so can we. But I think that when Jesus was on the cross, he also had in mind the last half of that psalm. Because I don't know if you noticed it, if you didn't go back and read it. I mean, even if you did go back and read the psalm, it is a beautiful psalm. It will not take you that long to read it, to wrestle with it, to kind of pay attention to the language. But there there are two halves to this psalm. The first one lives situated definitely inside the brokenness of the world. God, everything is going wrong. Everything is dark. Everything is hopeless. Where are you at? Why are you distant? Why are you forsaking me? God, where are you? Are you going to do something? Anything. But the second half of the psalm, and uh, the psalmist seems to be writing this after the fact rather than in the moment reflecting on a chapter in his life. The second half of the psalm says, but I am going to stand before your congregation. I am going to sing your praise until the day that I die. You are the source of my praise because when I cried out, that's what we see in the first half of the psalm. When I cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where are you at? What are you doing? You answered my cry. That even in the midst of the darkness, when I couldn't see you, yet you were still there. Even in the midst of all of the noise of the brokenness of the world, when I couldn't hear your voice, yet you were still speaking. Even when I thought that I was alone, I was not. Even when I thought there was no hope, there was still hope. Psalm 22 is about those broken moments in life where we enter into the darkness of the world and we seem to be able to find no way out of the darkness of the world. But it is precisely in the darkness of the world that God hears our cry. And God answers our cry. And God is present with us in the darkness. Now let me just give you a little bit of a plug for uh, what we've been doing on Wednesday night for the last little while. There have been starts and stops and things like that. But we've been talking about this very uh, exact, this, precisely this point of God's character. In Exodus, the uh, Exodus narrative says that the Israelites, they, they cried out in the darkness. They groaned out of the darkness. They, they lamented and, and wept in the darkness of their slavery and that God heard their cry. And hearing their cry, he took action and he redeemed. In Genesis chapter 4, 
when Cain killed Abel. Abel's blood cried out to God, and God heard the cry, and he acted. The way Matthew tells the story of Jesus in the beginning, it ends in chapter 2 with the massacre of the innocents. And the mothers of Bethlehem cry out in the darkness over the loss of their children. And the very next chapter, chapter 3, begins with the beginning of Jesus' ministry. John the Baptist leading into his baptism, into his temptation, into his ministry proper. Jesus is the answer, God's response to those women crying out of the brokenness. In Revelation, uh, starting in chapter 5 and going through verse 11, one particular telling of the story. Uh, the uh, saints who had died and were under the altar of God in heaven, they, they cry out to God again and again, how long, how long will you let these trials continue, these tribulations continue, this injustice continue? And in Revelation's very weird way of telling the story, um, God says, even now I'm answering that cry, even in Romans 8. Uh, probably, if I had to guess, one of our favorite chapters in the Bible. Everybody is groaning. We are groaning under the burden of our broken world. Our broken world is groaning under the burden of the curse. And it says in verse 28 that even, or verse 26 and 7, even the Spirit groans with us. And God is faithful to hear that groan. And so this season is about coming face to face with the darkness and the brokenness of the world that is controlled by death. The season is about coming to terms with the world that we have. And sometimes in that world that we have, we are simply going to cry out. Something is going to smack us upside the head. Something is going to overwhelm us. Something is going to bowl us over. Something is going to hit us so hard that we don't know what to do. And so we just say, God, where are you? And there are some in our religious traditions that would say that makes us less than faithful, that that means that we are a bad Christian. But the psalmist would say, that's the way it works. And God hears that cry. And God answers, I'm still with you. I'm still acting. I'm still present. You may not be able to see me. You may not be able to hear me. But I'm not far away. And certainly this is a theme that as we head towards Calvary, as we head towards the tomb, as we head towards resurrection, that we're going to come on again and again and again. And I think ultimately to anticipate Calvary when Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? That in that moment of darkness, he also remembered the end of that psalm that he was quoting, the, the one that says, yet God hears the cry. Because it was precisely in the cross that God was answering our cry in the darkness. He was defeating the power of death. And he was bringing about, about a new world in which things are made right. All right, so that's just a little reflection on Psalm 22 because we had already covered the text in Mark for this week. And so next week we will uh, probably get back to Mark. But either way, we'll continue with the theme talking about the story of Jesus. We've got about a minute left before uh, my video file runs out. So let's pray. Lord, help us to hold on to you in the darkness. Help us to remember you are there even when we can't see you. And we come together and we pray as a family. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we've forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory now and forever. Amen. Church, we love you and we miss you. And this is, this is one of those times of darkness. So let us cry out to God in the midst of this pandemic, in the midst of all the controversies and the trials. And let us know that he is there with us hearing our cry. We love you and we'll see you next time.